I like you to look at your hands. Uh, some of us have big hands, some of us have small hands, some of us have very skilled hands. If you are a professional baseball player, you could make millions of dollars because of the way you use your hands. You know, my son got into baseball, so we bought a ball. And that ball was approximately $15. But in the hands of Alex Rodriguez, one of the best players in the world, that ball, the same ball, is worth $25 million. Uh, I took a free class at the seminary because I teach there. They say you can take one class free every year. So I took tennis. And I bought a ball of tennis. And it was $6. But in the hands of Serena Williams, that's the best tennis player in the world, that same ball is worth $28 million. It all depends on the hands. The greatest hand in all of history are the hands of Jesus. Everything he touched brought life to it. And today I'm going to share with you a biblical story about what the hands of Jesus did. And then I'm going to tell you a contemporary story about when we surrender everything to Jesus, what he will do to us. Father in heaven, as we're going to look at this story in the Bible, I pray that it will come alive to us, and that it will inspire us, that it will motivate us, that it will touch us, and that we will know beyond any shadow of doubt that if we surrender things into your hands, amazing things will take place. Lord, speak through me, and Lord, bless my friends here. In Jesus' name, amen. One day, Jesus got tired. So he decided to go to a secluded place. But the crowd heard about it. So they followed him. And guess what was the size of the crowd? It says 5,000 men. But obviously, there were women and children because we know there was a little boy in that crowd. So, even if we go by our standard today of a family with two kids, that's 20,000 people were there at the mountain. And Jesus is a preaching to them. He's healing them. You know, he went over there to have a secluded time, but he decided to minister to them anyway. So, all the way from morning till evening, he's ministering to the people. And then the disciples came to Jesus and said, you know, it's getting late. We love your preaching. You are a great preacher, but we still have to send them back home to find some food to eat. They are hungry. Restaurants are going to close. Supermarkets are going to close. Just send them home. And Jesus said, well, why don't you give them some food to eat? Remember the story? And I'd like you to open your Bibles with me. I'm going to give you a composite of this story over the four Gospels. By the way, this is another one of those stories that is repeated in all four Gospels, which tells you how important it is. I'm going to read from John chapter 6. Okay, so Jesus said, why don't you give them something to eat? Verse 7. Philip answered him, 200 denarii's worth of a bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. He said, well, we can't do this. 200 denarii's, that's 200 days of wages. We don't have it, and even if we have it, it wouldn't be enough to feed them. Maybe a little bit, a morsel for everyone. 
One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Are you getting the picture? The disciples don't believe you could do anything. We don't have the money. We don't have the resources. There is nothing we could do to feed this crowd of 20,000 people. So here is what Jesus did. He said, well, give me those five loaves of barley and the two fish. By the way, barley is an indication that this little boy was very poor because barley were the food of the poor people. Rich people will eat wheat. Think about it. There was a crowd of 20,000 people. You would think there would be other people who have their lunches with them. But only one was willing to share it, and that was the little boy. So picture the scene. Jesus said, have them sit 50, 100, all over the place. He took the five loaves of bread, and they were like pita bread, the round, uh, thin bread. And he took the first one, and he broke it in half. And guess what happened? Every half became one. And the little boy is amazed. It's like magic. Jesus takes another bread, breaks it in half, and becomes full. And he did this till all 20,000 people were fed. All of them. He did the same thing with the fish. So they had a fish sandwich. All of them had a wonderful fish sandwich. And then there were 12 baskets left over from this incident. We have disciples who are saying, we can't feed them, there is not enough food, there is not enough money. But Jesus fed everybody, and there was 12 baskets of leftover, one for each one of the doubting disciples. I like to draw two lessons from this story. Lesson number one. The disciples lived in a world of very limited possibilities. But Jesus lived in a world of unlimited possibilities. The disciples forgot that the same God fed two million plus people in the wilderness when he took them out of Egypt. The same disciple forgot about what happened in the Old Testament with Elijah and the feeding of the 120. They forgot about the power of God. That was a persistent problem with those disciples because the disciples lived in a world of very limited possibilities. Jesus lived in a world of unlimited possibilities. The difference was, which is the second point, there was somebody who was willing to surrender what he had to Jesus. And that was the little boy. And because he gave everything he had to Jesus, he ended up being the source of a blessing for 20,000 people. And ironically, the one who was the source of blessing for 20,000 people was someone who was not even counted. They only counted men. He was a little boy. 
But he was willing to give. And he made it into the Bible. You know, we don't know his name. We don't know his tribe. We don't know anything about him except he was willing to give everything he had to Jesus. And the result was amazing. I experienced this in a very powerful way. One day, it was Thursday afternoon, my conference president called me. He said, Pastor Joe, I am coming over to your area next Wednesday. Can we go out to dinner? I said, as long as you pay, I will go out to dinner with you at any time you want me to. So on Wednesday, we went out to dinner. And there were a lot of chit-chats. And I, I know there is an agenda to this. Eventually, we, I'm hoping we get to the point of why he wanted to meet with me. And finally, he got to it. He said, Pastor Joe, we are hurting financially. We're not meeting our budget. And we need to lay off three pastors. But the pastor of the district next to you decided to accept a call outside of our conference. So we thought about giving you one of his churches and giving his other church to the district on the other side. And in this case, we only have to lay off two pastors. Oh, I said, no problem. We would love to have another church. We already had a big church that have about six, 700 people in attendance. We planted another church that was about 200. We were planting a third church, about 30 people. So I said, we would love to have another one. Give, give it to us. Tell me more about this church. He said, a group of German immigrants came to this valley and they built the most magnificent church in the whole valley. It's the best looking the nicest. They built a school. They grew to about 100 and uh, uh, maybe 20 people or something like that. Uh, they had a big auditorium to minister to the community. They had a, a, a Dorcas Society. And I noticed everything he was saying was in the past. So I said to him, what about today? What happened to this group of people? Well, he said, because of internal conflicts, this group of people, it dwindled down from about 120 people to about 13 people. Well, I said, that's fine. Do they do any form of evangelism? He said, the last time they did any form of evangelism was 26 years ago. I said, do they have any baptism? He said, the last time they had any baptism in this church was 20 years ago. I said, I don't want this church. He said, it's our gift to you. It's your church now. It's yours. Well, the whole thing was done deal, actually, before even the meeting happened. I said, that's fine. So I took my family and went to this church, first time, our first Sabbath there. I didn't see 13 people, never saw 13 people. I only saw nine. But if you add myself, my wife, and my two kids, that would make it 13 people. So they were people of hope. So one day I sat in my office and I listed 10 ways, like strategic planning to revive this church. So I took this sheet of paper with me and I went to my first board meeting. And I thought I would start with something very simple and then move into the serious ones. So uh, I uh, said, why don't we have a bulletin over here? I noticed we don't have any bulletin. The head elder stood up. He was always in the habit of standing up when he spoke. And he spoke with a very thick German accent. And he looked at me and he said, that is the most ridiculous idea I ever have heard in my life. We don't need a bulletin. There are only 13 of us. We know everything. And plus, this is killing the environment, cutting trees. And he went on and on giving me a lecture about the environment. 
it was so lengthy, so negative. He killed my spirit. Never went to any other point on the agenda. I, I, just, I just checked out after a while. So forget it. When I gathered my courage, I modified my list of 10 ways to revive this church. And I went back again the following month to another board meeting. And this time again, I decided to start with something very simple. So I said, why don't we have potluck with each other? We need to eat with each other so we can get to know each other. He stood up. My heart went down. Every time this guy went up, I had a heart attack. I just went down. And he stood up and he said, that is the most ridiculous idea I ever have heard in my life. I said, why? He said, Pastor, I have to be honest with you and tell you. We hate each other at this church. If we eat with each other, we will kill each other. And then he went on for two hours about the history of how terrible this church was. On and on. He killed my spirit again. I said, forget it. I'm not moving into any other item. I modified my list and went back again in a month later to my other board meeting. And this time I decided to go into something more substantive. So I said, why don't we have Sabbath school for the children? Now the church did not have any children. In fact, the youngest person in that church was a woman who was 81 years old. <laughs> but my idea was to go out in the community, bring the kids, have vacation Bible school, Sabbath school for them. That was my idea. But he stood up, my head elders, and every time this guy stood up, my heart went down. I am regretting what he is going to say. I don't want to hear it. And then he looked at me and he said, that's not a bad idea. I was shocked. That's when my hair turned white at that moment. And then he went on for two hours telling me how terrible of a pastor I was. He said to me three, four times I was the worst pastor he ever had to work with. And he would be willing to take the Sabbath school time to teach me how to become a better pastor. <laughs> My idea was to, to reach out to the children of our community his idea was to teach me how to become a better pastor. Well, I was so discouraged. I left the board meeting. I was literally crying. I called a friend of mine. And I explained to him the situation. He said, I have the solution for you. I said, what is it? He said, first, you need to pray the prayers of John Knox. John Knox, the guy from Scotland. He was a reformer from Scotland. I said to him, I don't know his prayers. He said, he prayed that God will give him Scotland or he will die. I said, I'm not praying this prayer. I don't want to die. It's not worth it for me. He said, you pray this prayer. You're not going to die. Just pray this prayer. Pray that God will give you this valley for Jesus. I said, what is the second thing? He said, you need to surrender this church to Jesus. It's not your church. It's his church. And then he shared with me the story I just shared with you. He said, do you remember what happened when that little boy gave his lunch to Jesus, how Jesus took it and multiplied it and he fed the crowd of 20,000 people. He said, amazing things will happen in the hands of Jesus. He said, this is not your church. Give it to him. Have him be in charge of it. Give it to his hands. So we, 
right there we pray and we surrender this church to Jesus. And I started to pray the prayers of John Knox. I, the church was in the valley and there were hills and I would walk on these hills and acclaim this valley for Jesus. And I started to preach to the congregation about the importance of prayer and especially about the importance of intercessory prayer on behalf of other people. One person in that church caught the vision, one person. It was the youngest member, the 81-year-old woman, but she caught the vision. One day I preached on intercessory prayer, and this lady, Edna, went home, knelt down beside her bed, and she said, Lord, Pastor Joe asked us to find somebody we need to pray for. I don't know who to pray for, but I feel like I need to do this. And the Lord put on her heart her neighbor, Michelle. Michelle was a young woman, about 25 years old, who was in the habit of breaking all of the Ten Commandments every day a million times. She slept with a different guy every night. She was alcoholic. She was on a drug. She stole to support her habit. She was a totally messed up girl. And God is asking Edna, the Adventist woman, to pray for Michelle. All her life, Edna looked at Michelle in a very judgmental way. But when she started to pray for her, God gave her love for that woman. That's what God does really for us when we pray for other people. We start loving them. She started to go and become her friend. She invited her over to her house. She will go over to her house. She will bake bread for her on Friday night. She wanted to give her a taste of the Sabbath. She became her mentor, an elderly woman and a young woman. They became friends. They became very close friends because of prayer. Well, one day, I went to the board and I went straight to my top point now. Forget about the small ones. I said, I would like to do an evangelistic meeting at this church. My held elder stood up. My heart didn't go down this way, this time. And he said, we tried that 26 years ago and it did not work and we're not going to try it again. And he went on talking about how ineffective this and on and on and on. And I listened. I didn't get discouraged this time. When he was done from his history lesson, I looked at him and I said, look, I'll make a deal with you. You allow me to do it one more time. And if it doesn't work, I will never ask you to do anything after that. He said, will you be willing to put it in writing and sign your name that you will never ask me to do anything after this? I said, I will be willing to do that. Give me the document. I will sign it. So I sign a document that if this evangelistic meeting does not work, I'm not going to ask this church anything. Well, the evangelistic meeting was going to start on a Friday night. I called my conference president. I said, I want money. I want to advertise. I want to put it on the radio, billboard, and he was very gracious, gave me the money. I, I said, this is the situation. If we don't do something, I'm never going to be able to ask them to do anything after that. And then I called all of my friends and I said, please pray for me. We need it here at this church. Evangelistic meeting was going to start on a Friday night. On a Tuesday of that same week, this young lady, Michelle, went hunting with her mother. She drank, she became disoriented, and she shot her mother 
mistaking her for a deer. The mother survived. She was shot in the arm. But the experience shook her up. For comfort, she went to the Adventist woman. They became friends. And the Adventist woman did a marvelous job ministering to her. She took her into her house. She had her stay with her. She comforted her. She prayed with her. And on a Friday night, she brought her to my meeting. On a Friday night, I came to the church at 5 o'clock in the evening. The meeting was supposed to start at 7. I set up my slides. I went to a side room like that one, or this one, the prayer room, and I spent two hours on my knees praying for this evangelistic meeting. And then I came out to face the crowd. And I was so disappointed. No one came, except my faithful nine people. They all came. Some of them came because they were curious to see if this will work or not. And Michelle was there. Nine people plus this woman. And that woman was brought by Edna. And I... I said, Lord, why would you do that to me? Why? No one is here. We spent money, we prayed, we advertised, we fasted, and nothing happened. Well, I just gathered my courage, my composure, and I wanted to preach. And the slides were on the second coming. I opened my mouth and nothing came out. Now it became very uncomfortable. I had another disappointment. I can't preach. So I'm pleading with the Lord. And I heard his voice saying, forget about the second coming. I'm going to give you the sermon for today. Preach about my love. And my, my mouth was open. And I preached for 45 minutes about the love of God. I looked at Michelle straight in the eyes for 45 minutes and told her about how much God loved her. I went from story to story to story in the Bible telling her how much God loved her. I remember at one time in the sermon I said, look, God is not interested in your past. God is interested in your future. He's a loving and forgiving God. And then at the end, I gave an altar call. And the elderly woman dragged this young lady to the front. And I prayed. And everybody left except the three of us. And we sat in the front of the church, all the three of us. And I started to explain the gospel. I told this young lady, if she was the only person on the planet Earth, Jesus would still have died for her. I told her about the new life in Jesus, a wonderful new life. I will never forget this. At 2 o'clock in the morning, she started to cry. And she said to me, I don't have to sleep with a different guy every night to feel loved. Jesus loves me. It's like the light shine inside of her. And then she said, I don't have to do drugs to feel good about myself. Jesus loves me. I saw a transformation happen right in front of me. And I said to her, would you like to give your heart to Jesus? And she said, yes. Well, I said, pray after me. And she prayed and gave her heart to Jesus. And we all were crying. I mean, it was one of the most joyful experiences you could have. 
And then I went to one of the pews and I took a Bible and I opened it to the Gospel of John and I put a marker on it. I said, Michelle, this Bible is a gift to you. I want you to go home and read chapter one of the Gospel of John and come back tomorrow night. It was 2.30 in the morning. We were all very tired. We left. And uh, I had three services I had to take care of. In the evening, I came back. It's five o'clock in the evening, and I went to that side room to pray. Came out at seven, and I look at the audience. They were my faithful nine. Plus Michelle, this young lady. Plus 54 more people in the audience. 54 more people. Here is what happened. So Michelle in the morning took the Bible and opened it to the place where I told her to read it. She read John chapter 1. And the Word of God got hold of her. She loved it. So she read chapter 2. The first miracle Jesus performed. She was thrilled, excited. So she moved to chapter 3. And she read about the new birth, the encounter of Jesus with Nicodemus and the importance of being born again. And she prayed and said, Lord, that's what I want today. She kept reading. She went to chapter 4. She quit. What's in chapter 4? Does anybody remember? The Samaritan woman. What did the Samaritan woman do? After she had an encounter with Jesus, she went back to her village. And she told them about her encounter. The whole village came to see Jesus. The whole village. This lady was a prostitute, the Samaritan woman, and, and at least in the culture of that time. But her encounter was so amazing, so unbelievable. The whole village came to see Jesus. Michelle said to herself, if this woman could do it, I could do it too. So she got on the phone on Sabbath morning, and she called all of her friends and relatives to come and hear about Jesus. Fifty-four of them came. I had the evangelistic meeting for five weeks. And at the end of the five weeks, Michelle got baptized. Plus 11 more of her family. In a church that have not had any baptism for 20 years. They doubled overnight. And then God took two women. Very different woman. One grew up in the church. She played the piano, but she didn't know how to play the piano. It was terrible, but people loved her. <laughs> and then a woman who was on the street and through their ministry and their prayer, a revival came to that church. I had that church for four and a half years. And then we gave it to somebody else. First Sabbath I was there, there were nine people, plus myself, my wife, and my two kids. Four and a half years later, I was there for the last time in that church. There were still nine people, which tells you how wonderful pastor I am, because not one of them died in four and a half years. And all of them were over the age of 80. They all were there. I took good care of them. Plus, Michelle. Plus, 179 people. God did a miracle. Unbelievable miracle. That church grew from 10 people to almost 200 people. And to God be the glory. 
Friends, that's what happens when we pray and we surrender everything into the hands of Jesus. That's what happens. By the way, what happened to my head elders? God changed him too. At the end of the meeting, he came to me. And he said, Pastor Joe, can we do this again next year? Friends, some of you have come with heavy burdens on your hearts. Some of you have churches that are difficult, like the one I described. Some of you, you have members in your churches that are as difficult as the man I had in that church, my head elders. But here is my appeal to you. Surrender everything to Jesus and pray like your life depends on it. If you surrender your ministry to Jesus, your school, your church, your home, he will bless it and he will multiply it like what he did in the Bible. Don't depend on yourself, your cleverness, your talents. Depend on the power of Jesus. Maybe you have heavy hearts. Maybe you have burdens. Maybe you have difficult churches. Maybe you have challenges in the school. Today is your day to turn it over to Jesus. And in the hand of Jesus, everything will be okay, will be better than okay, will be wonderful. I look at our leaders from the various churches that are here. Surrender your ministry to Jesus, whether you are an elder, whether you are a deacon, a Sabbath school teacher, and God will bless this ministry like he blessed when I surrender that little church to Jesus, I know he will do great things in your midst. Let's pray. Father, we are surrendering everything to you. We can't do anything. We're like those disciples as well. We don't have money. We don't have resources. We don't have bread. But you lived in a world of unlimited possibilities. And you were able to feed the crowd and even more. And today we know that you will be able to bless churches and schools and homes and even more. We love you, Lord. We are surrendering everything to you. In Jesus' name, amen.